What's up guys, it's Dolmatter here and today we're going to be reacting to Cutting Defense Spending Isn't Enough to Pay for Social Spending Plans. This is from Common Sense Soapbox, obviously a libertarian uh, page, partially run by Seamus, the guy from Freedom Tunes, and yeah, uh, don't have much to say about that other than I think it'll, it'll obviously help pay for them, but I don't think people realize how much a lot of these plans cost, and then the other factor with them is that they're essentially Ponzi schemes. And what you see with a lot of these plans is essentially they will they, they require a massive birth rate, which they because of the amount of spending they have, they also help to lower the birth rate. And then you need to bring in massive amounts of immigrants from other countries. And then you get into issues like, you know, you can only bring in so many immigrants before it causes destabilization, like we've seen in a lot of Western countries, because you have competing ethnic groups that don't get along. On top of that, you also have the fact that because of other countries westernizing, their populations are, their, sorry, their birth rates are drastically dropping. So eventually you're not even going to have the option to pull in these populations from other countries because they're not going to have the population to pull from. And then the, the final factor when it comes to all of this is it, it, it presupposes that like we should even be attempting to do these things in the first place, right? you know, all these arguments about like how we could possibly do it. It's like, okay, well, how about why we should even do it? But anyway, link to the original video is down below. Remember to like, comment, subscribe to help the algorithm and let's jump right into it. So that's why our military budget is too high and the wars aren't good for our country. Exactly. The military is obscenely expensive. We can't even take care of our own citizens because we spend more maintaining a global empire than we do on anything else. That's actually not true. What you say? What if I told you that our global empire is actually less expensive than social welfare spending? I would slap you and call you a liar. Our global empire is actually less expensive than social welfare spending. Liar! Social <laughs> security alone is more expensive than the entirety of the armed forces. We also spend more on health care than on the military. For some, that's a white pill, but others can't help but wonder, why are Medicare and Medicaid more expensive than the largest military that has ever existed? We're certainly not getting what we're paying for. Well, I think a big factor is obviously how unhealthy the population is. You know, when you, like, obviously he's talking about the United States here. In the United States, approximately 40% of the population is obese, which means they have a, but for men, I think it's above a 30% body fat ratio. For women, I think it's above 32 or 34% because they're supposed to have slightly more body fat than a male. Another 40% is overweight, which means like unhealthily overweight, but not to the point of morbid obesity, which means when you combine those two together, 80% of the population is at least overweight, if not obese. The number one and number two cause of death in, in most Western countries and also in the United States are heart disease and cancer. The number one cause of both of those is poor diet and obesity. So a lot of the big issues that people are having when it comes to like heart disease and cancer and all of these other related issues are self-inflicted from poor diet. So a big reason why healthcare is so expensive is because people can't control their eating habits. And you don't really have any healthy eating plans. I don't know if the United States has anything similar, but up in Canada, we had a thing when I was growing up called the food pyramid. And the food pyramid would tell you your recommended daily amount of eating for all these different foods. But the problem was, it, it, like, it wasn't actually like anything that was done scientifically. It was literally an advertisement by the dairy and grain cartels up here. So they they recommended something like twice the recommend like twice the actual amount of dairy you should be eating a day, and something like four to eight times the amount of grain you should be eating a day. Right, if you actually followed that food pyramid, you'd be eating like 6,000 calories a day or something. It was absolutely ridiculous, the amount of food and the types of food that you should be eating. But it was basically just an advertisement that they marketed as if it was an actual health program. But, and I imagine the States has very similar stuff. And you see this a lot of the time with like, you know, doctors recommending, well, not so much anymore, but like doctors used to recommend sugar. Doctors used to, you know, recommend, you know, you want to get away from fatty diets, even though now we know that like, fats aren't actually that bad for you ironically fatty food doesn't make you fat more of it a lot more how it has to do with carbs uh and then there's also the other factor which unfortunately is kind of taboo with current left-wing political views which are the mainstream dominant political views is that a big factor in what you should be eating comes down to like where your ancestry is from 
right? You know, so, when you go to like Northern Europe, something like 99.9% .9 of people are able to drink milk, right? Lactose intolerance is virtually non-existent. Like one in a thousand people is lactose intolerant. But then you go to the, the, the rest of the world, right? You go to like Southern Europe, it's like 70 to 80% of people are lactose tolerant. You go to the Middle East, it's like 60%. Uh, West Africa is pretty high. Uh, funnily enough, actually a separate gene in West Africa. The, the gene that's through Eurasia seems to largely be associated with the Indo-European expansions. So the groups that have the more Yemnaya Indo-European DNA tend to be more lactose tolerant, which is why it's so much more common in Northern Europe and Southern Europe and the Middle East and North India. But uh, Africa, West Africa, has its own specific gene mutation that basically was like a convergent evolution for the same thing. But, uh, you know, outside of like West Africa and the Indo-European populations, a lot of other countries, it's like 98, 99 percent of people are lactose intolerant. Right. So why would you be giving the same diet to somebody who's able to process milk and their ancestors have been able to process milk for thousands of years as you would to somebody whose ancestors weren't able to process milk? On top of that, you know, like people who grew up in like a more northern climate, there's going to be a lot less vegetation and a lot more meat. So they're probably going to have to have a meatier diet. You actually see this with Inuit specifically. Um, you know, they have a really easy time processing meat and a much harder time processing vegetables. Uh, and then obviously people who grew up in the jungle or, or sorry, who ancestors are from the jungle or some tropical climate, they're going to have basically the opposite problem, right? A diet that's high in fish and uh, fruits and vegetables is going to be much healthier for them. So a lot of it, you know, it's kind of taboo because, you know, people like to pretend evolution stopped as soon as, you know, human skin color changed, but it really didn't. There's, you know, differences in our diet, differences in what we're able to eat and big factors. But, you know, enough of me rambling on about dietary issues. Let's continue here. Nope. But maybe we could be? Just because certain programs cost more than the military doesn't mean we couldn't cut military spending to pay for things like the Green New Deal or something. Oh god, no. While the policies advocated for by social democrats like Bernie Sanders are often justified by scapegoating our obscene defense budget, in reality, these policies would dwarf military spending. For example, according to his own estimates, Bernie Sanders' proposed social welfare policies would nearly double federal spending. And just to be clear, his estimates are definitely a drastic undershot, considering Medicare for all by itself is predicted to cost that much. We could completely abolish the military and not even come close to raising enough money to pay for that. In fact, we could abolish the military, seize the wealth of every billionaire in the country, and double revenue from federal income tax and still not have enough. If the Fed monetized just half of that, we'd be looking at 10% annual inflation forever. What if we took your wallet? What? What if instead of raising all those taxes, we just took your wallet and pushed you off this raft? You wouldn't make a dent in the budget and would upset me immensely. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, so that's a big factor too. And not only that, but the one thing I find really irritating when people talk about this, a lot of the same people that talk about trying to curtail military spending are often the same people that want the U.S. to intervene in places like the Ukraine and all of these other places whenever you know some war actually does strike up. And they don't realize that, you know, you need this military to be ready and at, at, you know, at call at all times if you want to be able to do that. But the other thing is they don't realize that getting rid of the U.S. military would almost certainly allow for colonialism to reappear. Because the, the one big factor that not a lot of people know when it comes to colonialism is a big reason it ended is because the U.S. essentially bribed their way into a alliance to end the Cold War with NATO. Right? The U.S. basically spends a fuck ton of money on its military. It patrols the global oceans. Everyone's able to trade with everyone. You know, you have all these free trade agreements and, you know, nobody has to, like, protect their shipping lanes because the U.S. is protecting all shipping lanes. And because of that, pirating and privateering has essentially been non-existent. Now, there is some, like Somalia is probably the most famous region. Um, there is some, you know, pirating and privateering but hardly any compared to what there used to be, right? You used to have privateering, that, it, privateering is basically state-sanctioned uh, pirating of every major resource all the time, right up and including until World War II, right? And not even just during war times, that was kind of the key thing with privateers, is they would go out and pretend to be on their own, but a lot of the time they were secretly backed by some government, and you would instantly have that return. You would also have all of these nations which are 
you know, competing for resources. Right now, they're able to make these trade agreements because of the United States. But as soon as the U.S. starts, you know, stops defending tr uh, trade lanes, they would all be competing to one defend their own trade lanes, and then two stop other people from having their trade lanes because. If you want to drive up domestic production and drive up, you know, domestic sales, one of the best ways to do that is to make it very difficult for your enemies or adversaries or competitors, whatever you want to call them, to be able to sell products. So I don't think people really realize what would happen if the U.S. curtailed its military spending. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that 90 plus percent of people, well, more than that, 99 percent of people around today were born after World War II and they, you know, they don't really pay attention in history to realize what going back to a pre-globally dominant America would be. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.